These are in listen only mode. Welcome. My name is Sylvia Huntley, and I serve on the American School Health Association's Professional Development Committee. Thank you for joining us today for our presentation, Bullying Prevention and Suicide Prevention for Schools, a Digital Approach from SAMHSA. Before we get started, I would like to share a little bit about the American School Health Association. Otherwise known as OSHA, we are the only organization that addresses multiple disciplines in school health that is devoted solely to school health. Our membership of approximately 800 individuals represents school health as administrators at the local, state, and national levels as health and education professionals in a pre-K through 12 school setting and as academics who conduct research that informs school health professionals. We are also the proud publishers of the Journal of School Health a premier journal in the area of school and adolescent health. Members of OSHA can elect to receive a hard copy or electronic copy of this journal. Our membership fee is inexpensive and provides you access to the journal and also to our bi-weekly e-newsletter school health action, as well as free continuing education hours through webinars such as today's presentation and through CE qualifying JOS articles. If you haven't already, please consider joining, volunteering, and becoming a member of the OSHA community. Visit us at our website, which is posted right there on the slide, which is oshaweb.org, to learn more. We would love to have you and your colleagues join OSHA this fall in sunny Orlando, Florida, October the 15th through 17th for our 2015th conference going the distance. Featuring keynote speakers are Dr. Kenneth Ginsberg, a pediatrician and specialist in adolescent medicine at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and Dr. Wayne Gills, Director of Division of Population Health from Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. ASHA's two and a half days conference is filled with pre-conference workshops, oral sessions, and poster sessions offered over four tracks. These tracks are administration, coordination, and leadership. The second one, programs and services. The next one, research and emerging issues. And the fourth track, teaching and learning. More information about our conference can be found again at our website, www.ashaweb.org. As I mentioned, the continuing education credit for today's webinar is free for all members. However, if you are a non-member, and you would like to receive CE credit for this webinar, we require a payment of $30. After the webinar, you can receive one Category 1 CECH for MCHES and CHES, or a certificate of attendance based on 70% or more participation today. 
Participation is measured by the amount of time the webinar remains active on your screen. We will provide details for obtaining CE in a post-webinar email, which will go out this week to you. A couple of notes before we begin. Your phones will remain muted for the 60-minute duration of this webinar. If you have any questions for our presenter, please type them into the questions box on your screen. We will answer your questions today as time allows. All unanswered questions will be responded to and provided in a post-webinar email, which you will receive this week. We will also include the evaluation survey, instructions for submitting for CE, and a link to the recording of this presentation. Now let's get started with today's session. We are delighted to have Elizabeth Perez from SAMHSA with us today, presenting, again, bullying prevention and suicide prevention for schools, a digital approach from SAMHSA. Just a little more information about Elizabeth Perez. Elizabeth Perez is a public health advisor and health communication specialist at the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. She serves as the project officer for SAMHSA's public engagement platform, known as PEP, P-E-P. PEP provides the public and the federal government with one stop quick access to mental health, substance abuse prevention, and addictions treatment information. And prior to her work at SAMHSA, Ms. Perez served as a public health advisor and health communication specialist for the Office of Minority Health, known as OMH. During her time at OMH, Ms. Perez led the planning and implementation of the agency's public health programs, projects, and campaigns for racial and ethnic minority populations. Ms. Perez holds a Master of Public Health degree with a concentration in health policy and leadership from Loma Linda University in California. Welcome, Elizabeth. I now turn it over to you. Well, good afternoon and welcome everyone. As mentioned, my name is Elizabeth Perez and I work at the off within the Office of Communications at the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or what we like to call short as SAMHSA. SAMHSA is an agency housed within the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and our mission at SAMHSA is to reduce the impact of substance use and mental illness in American communities. We know that prevention work Treatment is effective and people recover from mental and substance use disorders. SAMHSA is working to address the challenging public health problems inclu including bullying and suicide. I'm excited to share more about SAMHSA's digital approach to bullying prevention and suicide prevention for schools. But before I dive in, I would like to thank a ASHA and specifically Lee Lowry, Linda, Linda Morse, and Sylvia for giving me the opportunity to share this information with you today. Next slide. To begin our webinar, webinar today, I'd like to share with you on how SAMHSA's efforts connect with your work in schools and among students. We'll talk about bullying prevention and suicide prevention with the whole child approach. I'll provide you an overview of bullying and suicide and how these challenges relate to your work. And then we'll discuss SAMHSA's work to prevent bullying and suicide and through the development of our mobile apps and other programs and resources for your toolbox as you think about heading back to school this fall. Next slide. Many of you on this webinar are familiar with the whole child concept, which says that each child in each school in each of our communities deserves to be healthy, safe, engaged, 
supported, and challenged. All educators want to improve the work they do for students, for their families, and for their communities. And we all want a safe and supportive school climate. Just as we know that school health goes beyond the classroom, bullying prevention and suicide prevention go beyond a specific incident. At SAMHSA, we talk a lot about prevention because we know that it's effective. And this applies to the whole child concept as well. Preventing bullying and suicide both require the assistance and cooperation of educators, families, social services, and many other community supports. We know that classroom instruction on what constitutes bullying and how, it and how to develop skills on how to deal with it are par part of health education. We know that school nurses frequently see kids who are being bullied and who are showing risk factors of bullying or suicidal ideation or behaviors are in the, come to the health office. Developing a positive social and emotional climate within schools is critical to ensuring that students are healthy, safe, and supported. You've likely seen the signs advertised, advertising bullying-free zones and PSAs encouraging students not to be bystanders and to stop bullying in its tracks. But bullying prevention goes beyond talking the talk. It's integrated in the school's climate, it's embodied in the model of the school's educators, and it's communicated, enforced, and reinforced to students and their families. Suicide prevention is, is a difficult topic, and no one, likes to, no one wants to talk about suicide, especially when it comes to young people. But the reality is that suicide can be prevented, and educators can use the constructs of the whole child approach to create a safe and supportive space for important actions and conversations to take place. When the grief counselors leave the school in the weeks after a tragedy, such as when a child commits suicide, we need to remember that it doesn't mean that students just move on. As many of us know too well, it takes a long time for wounds to heal and for individuals to identify and seek out needed treatment. So as I continue to talk about bullying and suicide throughout this presentation, I hope that you'll be thinking about how some of the concepts and tools I'll be sharing with you can apply to the bigger picture of school climate and how to prepare students for success now and for the future. Next slide. So we knew, as we know from the news media and from our experience in schools that bullying takes many forms. StopBullying.gov is one of SAMHSA's partners in bullying prevention and it is defined and its definition is the one that we tend to use the most. The last line that kids who are, who are bullied and those who are bullying others may have serious long lasting problems in this, in, and it is in particularly important. The person who bullies is often fighting other battles at school or at home, and bullying pre prevention can include engaging with the bully or trying to understand and address what else is going on from a glance of, of compassion. You don't have to be a guidance counselor or school psychologist to intervene. Whether you have a formal behavioral health trainer or not, the support of a caring adult can make a huge difference to a child in need. Next slide. I'm pleased to share that as of, this, as of spring, the National Center of Education Statistics reports that the overall bullying rates has declined to its lowest reported level since 2005. Comparing 2011 data with one of the most recent 2013 data, bullying among youth ages 12 to 18 has decreased by 6%. Cyberbullying, too, is, on the is also on the decline. As a bit of a surprise, given the popularity of social media platforms like Instagram and Snapchat, and the seemingly never-ending reports about how these apps are being used by students to isolate classmates and carry forth in-person bullying beyond the school grounds. Nevertheless, this promising report results demonstrate the benefits of effective bullying prevention tools and programs that are being implemented. Organizations such as ASHA's work Ensure students become, ensure schools become places where every student learns and thrives. SAMHSA's programs like Safe Schools and Healthy Students and similar programs from our federal and community partners have made a measurable impact on states and communities across the country. Next slide. 
So bullying by the numbers. Additional data from the NCES report reveals that girls report being bullied more than boys, which is consistent with other reports. We also see that bullying crosses racial and ethnic lines, reinforcing that bullying remains an issue in many communities and populations. Next slide. Education Secretary Arne Duncan sums the latest NCES report with the quote you have, you're seeing on the screen. We should be proud of the strides that we've made so far to prevent and reduce bullying, but we still have a long way to go. Particularly striking is the use of the word safety. If students don't feel safe in schools, how can we expect them to be successful? Beyond the classroom, we want to ensure that our most Valuable members of society, our children, feel safe and nurtured wherever they are. Next slide. Let's look at the impact of bullying. There are still those who say that bullying is part of growing up, that kids will be kids and it's usually harmless. But taking a look at the negative outcomes that, let's look at the negative outcomes that result from bullying such as depression, substance use, violence, and poor social functioning. The bottom line is that bullying is not harmless. Though it may be a buzzword in the media, it's not something that should be taken lightly. Bullying has a serious impact that can have long-lasting effects. And on the screen are just some of the impacts of bullying and the negative outcomes. Next slide. Speaking of serious issues, I'd like to discuss the latest statistics in, in school-age suicide. New CDC data tells, that, tells us that suicide is the third leading cause of death for people aged 10 to 24. It's re, it results in approximately 4,600 lives lost each year. But death from youth to suicide is only part of the problem because more young people survive suicide attempts than actually die. A nationwide survey on youth in grades 9 through 12 in public and private schools in the U.S. found that 16% of students reported seriously considering suicide. 13% reported creating a plan to commit suicide. And 8% reported trying to take their own life in the 12 months preceding the survey. Each year, approximately 157,000 youth between the ages of 10 and 24 receive medical care for self-inflicting injuries at emergency departments across the U.S. Next slide. Cultural variations in suicide rates also exist, with American, Indian, and Alaska Native youth having the highest rates of suicide-related fatalities. You may have seen some of the reporting in the news media about a string of youth suicides on, on the Pine, Pine, Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota over the past few months. Since December, seven young people, the youngest just 12 years old, have taken their lives, shaken the community and the schools. School and tribal leaders have been very involved hosting community meetings and seeking federal assistance. It was recently reported that teachers foiled a plan by several high school girls on the reservation to take their lives simultaneously. Suicide can be prevented, and any caring adult can help. In the terms of other high-risk populations across the country, a nationwide survey of youth in grades 9 to 12 in public and private schools in the U.S. found that Hispanic youth were more likely to report attempting suicide than their black and white non-Hispanic peers. Next slide. So there are several risk factors that can put a young person at risk for suicide. Many of you see the same students day in and day out. This is why engaging and fostering a dialogue showing you care, and simply asking how a student is doing can make a world of a difference. Identifying and intervene, intervening with students at risk of suicide can also help save lives. Referring to treatment facilities also provide quality and provide, that provide quality care and a support network are also 
ways to help provide in ways that may may connect someone that may not have be able to find resources on their own. Next slide. Bullying and suicide have a complex connection. It's important to emphasize that link, linking bullying and suicide as a direct cause and effect oversimplifies the situation as other factors may contribute to or protect against suicide. Yet these two issues are certainly related. That's why providing family, social support, and the supportive school environment is so important. According to the CDC, youth who report both bullying others and being bullied or being victims of bullying have the highest risk for suicide-related behavior of any groups that report involvement in bullying. And being involved in bullying in any way as a person who bullies or, or a person who is being bullied or a person who both is bullying and is being bullied, a bully victim, is one of the several important risk factors that appears to increase in the risk of suicide among youth. Certainly, bullying and suicide are two of the nation's pressing public health issues. At TAMSA, we have developed and support a number of programs, grants, technical assistance centers, publications, and other resources to help mitigate these issues. Last year, we took an innovative approach to tackling these issues head on by developing mobile applications or apps to address bullying and suicide in new ways. Next slide. As I mentioned earlier in this presentation, SAMHSA believes in the power of prevention. Two of the mobile apps we created, No Bullying and Suicide Safe, take a prevented approach to these important public health issues. Both apps provide an on-the-go access to resources that can help address bullying and suicide. I'd like to talk about bullying first, but before I jump in, I'd like to share that while we're on these two mobile apps on this webinar, to date, SAMHSA has developed four mobile apps to address, address various public health issues. The SAMHSA disaster app helps first responders address disaster behavioral health needs during a disaster, such as a hurricane, and Talk They Hear You app, which helps parents talk to their kids about underage drinking. You can learn more about our apps at www.samhsa.gov. Next slide. No Bullying is a mobile app that helps parents, caregivers, and educators prevent bullying by encouraging conversations with children. It is an app that is all about prevention. Research shows that kids value their parents or caregivers and educators' opinions and will look for them to advise, look for them for advice on everything from fashion trends to hobbies to tough issues like sex and bullying. In addition, kids who feel they have positive and open relationships with their parents or caregivers are more likely to be well-adjusted and have higher self-esteem, also precursors for bullying prevention. Next slide. We know that spending 15 minutes a day talking to a child helps build the foundation for a strong relationship and reassures them that they can come to you with any kind of problem. Engaging kids will also help build the resilience and give them the tools they need to identify and react appropriately to bullying. Keeping the lines of communication open is a key tactic for preventing bullying. Students who often want to talk so it's important that a caring adult takes the time to listen. Harkening back to the whole child concept, the No Bullying app is meant to help foster a sense of connectedness and provide support, especially to students struggling socially or emotionally. Next slide. So what does the app include? Well, it includes and it features conversation starters, warning signs to recognize if a student is affected by bullying, and a reminder feature with conversation starters to help you connect a specific student when the time is right. We're all busy in our personal and professional lives, and so you can use the app to remind yourself to reach back out to the student who told you that she was having trouble at home a couple weeks ago. So in this app, it allows you to put different profiles for children, and it'll send 
it'll give you conversation starters and it also ping you and give you a reminder to to have that conversation with that child. Next slide. I think we went one slide up. Once did we skip one slide? Back, back. Okay, go ahead and leave it there. No bullying includes some great resources for specific high-risk populations like LBGT youth and helps adults understand how to intervene, what to do, what not to do, and tips on cyberbullying and how to access treatment services through the SAMHSA Behavioral Health Treatment Locator. It provides a variety of resources to help prevent bullying before it even starts, which differentiates it from all the bullying reporting apps that you may have seen in app stores. Our app is free and available for download on Apple and Android devices. Next slide. So we've seen how important it is to talk about bullying. And we know that bullying and suicide among young people can be related. I'd like to tell you about Suicide Safe, another SAMHSA prevention-based mobile resource. What drove us to develop Suicide Safe is the fact that every 13 minutes, one person in the U.S. dies by suicide. I talked about those troubling statistics earlier in my presentation, but research also shows us that in the month prior to their death by suicide, 45% of people had had contact with their primary care physician and 20% of people had had contact with mental health services before they tried to commit suicide. What this tells us is that healthcare providers of all types and even caregivers who are close to young people serve as critical points of intervention when it comes to suicide prevention. To help caregivers and, and, to help caregivers and providers integrate suicide prevention efforts in their work, SAMHSA designated Suicide Safe. Suicide Safe is a free app optimized for tablets and is based on SAMHSA's Suicide Assessment Five Step Evaluation and Triage Card, or what we call the Safety Card. It includes conversation starters, case studies, resources, and SAM our SAMHSA treatment locator. Suicide Safe enables professionals to confidently assist patients who present themselves with suicidal ideation. It helps, communicate, helps them communicate effectively with individuals at risk of suicide and their families, determine appropriate next steps, and make referrals to treatment and, and community resources, which are all critical, critical components of saving lives. The major difference between no bullying and suicide safe is that while no bullying is meant to be used by parents, caregivers, and educators, suicide safe is designed to equip healthcare clinicians with important resources. So this app is really designed for health professionals, health and mental health professionals. So while many of you on this webinar won't be the ones to plug information into Suicide Safe, it's a certainly a great resource that can be shared with individual providers who may use it with their clients and patients. Next slide. Suicide is a really tough topic to discuss, so many of us simply choose to avoid it for the fear of saying the wrong thing. SAMHSA's Tip 50 is one of the resources included in Suicide Safe, and it offers a wealth of helpful advice when working with a person who may be in need of support. We know that asking about suicide thoughts can, can actually save a life, and it allows a person to feel safe and understood enough to raise concerns and beliefs with you. Someone who is, is a safe, caring adult. The app includes best practices and conversation tips to help ensure you communicate effectively. Next slide. One of, one of the important resources we, fe we feature front and center in the app are the national crisis lines, like the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. These lines are staffed with trained professionals who can provide critical assistance in a time of need. You'll see the Lifeline, Lifeline's number on the home screen of Suicide Safe in the lower right hand corner and as soon as you open the app. In case of immediate need, this provides direct upfront access and more information is available by typing more crisis line. 
The training and resources section of Suicide Safe contain a large amount of information about suicide prevention, and in this section we offer many resources. In addition to the perils of the publications like Tip 50 from the previous slide, other examples for training and resources include the publication Preventing Suicide, a Toolkit for High Schools. This toolkit is designed to assist high schools and school districts in creating and implementing strategies to prevent suicide and pr promote behavioral health. It includes tools to implement a multifaceted suicide prevention program that responds to the needs and cultures of students. It will assist students with it will assist teachers with setting up prevention programs that can be customized for their students. There's even a sample letter that can be sent to families. Next slide. Another important feature of the apps is the SAMHSA's Behavioral Health Treatment Locator, which I mentioned is also included in the No Bullying app, which gives you real-time access to treatment facilities in your area. This section requires connection to the internet via either a data plan or Wi-Fi and allows you to locate treatment facilities based on proximity or by searching for specific address. Details about each facility are provided on the tapping of more details. Facilities can be selected based on the need and you can send the information by email to another colleague, a student, a parent, or print this out for reference for later. One thing that I do like about this SAMHSA as mentioned in, in um, the slide, is that you can, as you put in your zip code, you can put it, sir, look in it within 50 mile radius to you. And then when you click into the more details, it'll tell you the type of services that the facility provides. So it'll tell you whether um, the facility operates on a sliding scale, whether it's fee-based, whether type of insurance it takes. In addition, it tells you if, it's, if the languages that are spoken there, um, and it also tells you whether it specializes, specializes with youth, et cetera, et cetera. Um, finally, Suicide Safe also has our conversation starters, where you can learn about ways to discuss suicide with someone who may be having suicidal thoughts or demonstrating suicidal behaviors. Conversation starters also include questions for starting the conversation, assessing risk, following up with a student who needs help, and tips on what not to say all of which can help guide a conversation on such a sensitive topic. Next slide. You play an important role in youth suicide prevention because you know that youth who feel connected to their school are less likely to engage in suicide-related behaviors. School connectedness is the belief held by students that adults and peers in the school care about their learning as well as them as individuals. It is also one of ASHA's core beliefs that school climate, school connectedness, and a caring and safe learning environment promote student success and teacher retention through parent and community partnerships, policies, and practices. That all students should be challenged, supported, engaged, and safe and healthy. At SAMHSA, we believe these principles as well, and that's why we wanted to create a simpler, more accessible way for you to help you prevent youth bullying and suicide. Now, the power of prevention also comes near in a handheld device. Next slide. So what can you do? Throughout this webinar, I mentioned that safe and supportive schools environment, bullying and suicide prevention are more than words. But sometimes all it takes is a few words to engage with a student and make them feel that they matter. Both, both of the SAMHSA apps I discussed help make having those conversations easier. Next slide. No Bullying and Suicide Safe are simple tools meant to engage on diff difficult topics. And we know from, from the parents, educators, and physicians, we've Talk to who helped inform the development of these apps and who uses these apps in their daily lives and that they do help. Each app has unique tools that you can use to help share the apps with your colleagues. The link posted on your screen, um, the bit.ly forward slash share no bullying, will send you to a page that houses a number of materials you can use to share 
no bullying, including social media messages, promotional videos, and a printable electronic poster, and more. Next slide. Tools that you can post, print, or share online about suicide safe can be accessed via the link on the slide, bit.ly forward slash share suicide safe. There's a nice video that shows highlights of the app, which is a great way to understand how it looks and feels. Next slide. I also urge you to learn more about the topics of bullying and suicide to better equip yourself, your colleagues, students, and families to help prevent these public health problems. You can visit SAMHSA.gov or the SAMHSA store and search suicide prevention or bullying to find digital and print resources to further support your efforts. Additionally, please visit StopBullying.gov and the CDC for other useful resources and data on these topics. Many statistics you've heard today are included in the new data just released in 2015. So be sure that you're up to date on the latest information and that you have access to the latest resources in the field. Next slide. Before I turn it back over to Lee, who will lead us, or to Sylvia, who will lead us into our brief question and answer, I would like to take this opportunity to thank you all for listening in today and for providing me the opportunity to share SAMHSA's tools with you. Your, ef your efforts to promote the w health and well-being of the nation's youth are much appreciated. Next slide. So I'll turn it back over to you. Uh, to Lee. To Lee. <laughs> Great, thank you, Liz. Um, everyone, this is Lee Lowry. I serve as ASHA's Executive Director, and we're almost ready to start today's Q&A session. However, um, I wanted to go ahead and give you the opportunity to go ahead and send in your questions. So while you are doing that, I just have a couple of quick reminders for you. First of all, we have recorded today's session, and we will answer as many questions today as time allows. And then we're going to follow, send you all a follow-up email later on this week that will include a link to the recording of the session, a PDF of our presentation slides, and um, any answers to the questions um, that we did not get answered today. So you can look for that uh, towards the end of the week. Okay, so now let me um, pull up our questions. You can just go with me. Um, okay. All right. So the first question, and this one's for me, um, is will CME be offered? Um, and if not, it's worth addressing the barrier in future ASHA webinars is, is what the person shared. And I can um, respond that we are, are not able to offer CME for today's session. However, we do provide um, a certificate of attendance, which you can share um, to try and see if you can get that approved. Okay, the next question, this one's for you, Liz. Um, the question is, are you saying that bullies may be at risk, I'm sorry, at increased risk of suicide? So what we're, yes, what we're saying is that obvious, when an individual is, we're saying those who not only are being bullied, but those who are bullying are at risk. Okay. And there's more information that can be found on stopbullying.gov. Okay, great. Um, the next question is, um, it's for me, will we be able to get this PowerPoint emailed to us so we can take it back to our colleagues that were not able to attend the webinar? And as I mentioned earlier, we will send a PDF of the PowerPoint slides and you will receive that later this week as well. Um, you'll receive the link to the recording, which you can actually share as well with your colleagues. Okay, the next question is, um, could you speak, speak briefly about confidentiality concerns related to entering student profile information in the No Bullying app? This seems like a great tool that could be very helpful to educators, but are there restrictions about the type of personally identifiable information I can put in the app? 
That's a great question. So one thing that I should bring up is that um, both our apps are, there's no HIPAA concerns with any of these apps because you don't put person, you don't put PHI in there. So in the no bullying, you'll put a name, but that's all you would put a name. And you could put a name, a very generic name. You don't have to put anything identifiable in there. So you can put a name, you can put A, you can, you can identify any way that you want. But even the no bullying and the suicide save, you don't actually put personal health information in there. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, the next person asked if they could see the app for the phones again, and I will, um, I'll bring that up. I'll see if I can do that. Um, I think that's right here. Is this it? Yeah, so one thing, so I will say in my former life I used to work at a hospital. Um, and so one of the things that we do notice is that in physicians and just healthcare is moving into a more um, trying to operate more efficiently. So our apps are created to be optimized for tablets um, in addition to phones. So we do see that in clinical settings, um, providers are more likely to use tablets and phones. So that's, what, so that's one thing. They are available on the iPhone and Droid devices, but in addition, you can download them into tablets. Great, thank you. Okay, the next question is, will the app uh, locate treatment services in Canada? It, all, it is only in U.S. territory. Um, and what the locator actually, so it actually congregates not only behavioral health um, treatment locators, but it's also integrated with, uh, with the federal qualified health centers, so HRSA's um, local clinics because whether the reality is some individuals may not directly feel comfortable going straight to a mental health facility. So we want them, whether it be a federally qualified health center or whether it be a mental health facility, we want them to have some sort of point of entry. So no, it does not do Canada, but it does all U.S. territories and it includes health centers in there. Okay, great. Our next question is, how should schools deal with suicide prevention and mental health is issues such as depression in health education classes? That's a great question. I think, um, so we do have that toolkit, which actually helps. Um, one thing that I will say is inside the Suicide Safe app, the PHQ-9 is in there, um, which is kind of the assessment for suicide prevention depression screening. Um, I think the app has a lot of different resources available for someone, um, but I think the challenge comes is within, one thing that you always want to do is make sure that someone feels comfortable to ask for help and being able to identify someone that needs help and giving them the con being a conduit for them to seek help. I think that's one way that we do need to approach it is that it's just not talking about this is what depression is, but also leading into if you, you or someone else is experiences, one, it's okay, um, and if you need help, here's help available. And at SAMHSA, our store, we have tons of resources that are available for people. Cause in an in a, in a educational setting, it may not be, people may not speak about it. Um, there's still some perceptions about mental health in general. Um, but I think the key is, is balancing resources, giving people information, in addition, um, balancing the, the, you know, what you have to cover as an educator. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is, do you recommend sharing this app with our students, or is it just for professionals? Um, so the, the no bullying, I, so I will say that both the apps, um, I think anybody can get, will find use in them. I think for students, because especially for suicide safe, 
it can be um, the language is kind of clinical based. So you know there are things that maybe you know suicidal ideation. A high schooler may not understand what that means. But I think it's it's a learning tool for anybody. Generally, we would like the students to um, to have the suicide prevention lifeline number because that's somewhere and they can and they can text that lifeline up as well. And if you go to our Stanford store, we can give you resources uh, to you know posters to get that number out. But in addition, but we we want them to be able to have access to someone to talk to versus trying to self-diagnose. Okay, great. The next question, do you have prevention toolkits for elementary and middle schools? So we have, we do have resources on bullying prevention um, on stopbullying.gov. But I think stopbullying.gov has a wide range because I've done in a combination with uh, U.S. Department of Health, Human Services, Department of Education, and, and other groups. So I think for for young for younger groups, that's the place to go. Specifically, when we have suicide, um, SAMHSA does not. Um, we just have things specific for high schoolers. Um, if we're talking about younger age, um, we don't have anything specific for them. But we do have stuff for like underage drinking, but it's more uh, parent focused. Okay. The next question, I believe um, what they're asking is whether or not these apps are free. All our apps are free. We're a federal, these are all, yeah, everything that we have is free since we are a, a federal agency. So these apps are completely free of charge. Great. Um, this person, uh, their comment is that they heard a lot about um, high school. Are there other recognizable signs of bullying in regards to schools K through five? We do. There's a whole list. Uh, there's a, a lot of these are kind of um, um, cross cutting. Um, but I, we, if you want for specific age groups, I would definitely go to stopbullying.gov. Um, they have a bunch of data and resources available there. Great. Okay, next question. If our agency is not in the app, can it be added? And if so, how do we do that? Sure. So if you go into, if you specifically, I think, I think what they're referring to is the treatment locator. Okay. I'm going to assume that that's what they're referring to. Um, but if it's the treatment locator, if you go on to our to stamsa.gov and then you type in treatment locator, on there there is an email list. Um, there's an email address, and then it, there's some information that you have to just submit to get your organization added into that treatment locator. Okay, great. Okay, the next question is for me. Um, and it has to do with the certificate of attendance, I believe, that I mentioned earlier. Um, one thing I meant to uh, mention at the top of the Q&A, or just ahead of the Q&A, was that we're also going to send all of the attendees a, an evaluation survey, which will include instructions for submitting for continuing education. So if you are interested in pursuing credit for continuing ed for today's webinar, You'll need to complete the evaluation survey and follow those instructions. And yes, we will provide those individuals a certificate of attendance. Okay, um, next question. Well, okay, what free services are available to schools? And I think that you just answered that, but let me know. If well, you one thing that I will say is since we are a federal agency, everything that we, we do is just public funds. So I highly recommend going to our SAMHSA store. There's so much resources from cultural competency, suicide prevention, substance use. Um, everything that we have on there is free. So we have, you know, hundreds of publications and toolkits that are that are available. So I would definitely recommend taking advantage of that in addition to our app. Okay, great. Um, Okay, I'm just reading a, it's a lengthy one. Um, 
It seems that the no bullying and suicide safe apps are great options for educators and parents. Uh, being that youth tend to be extremely into technology, are there any apps that kids and teens can download that correspond with the apps for parents so that both parent and child can use the technology to learn about suicide and bullying prevention? Um, there are, what I would say is there's, um, so there are other apps out there. Um, the challenge that we have, and now there's hundreds of apps out there, you know, to be honest, we have not reviewed them all, but one thing I will say is when you download a, an app from a federal agency, you know that the information is evidence-based and has been, um, has been researched and has the research to support it. So it's, it's and it's free. So I, I mean, I'm sure there are other apps out there. Um, I would just, my only caution would be is just ensuring that the information on there is is um, evidence based and it is, um, and making sure the app is free and making sure it connects you to um, resources that are um, that are appropriate. Okay, thanks. Next question, how is this information communicated to school district and building level administrators? Do you communicate with national and state school administrator organizations? So we do, so stopbullying.gov is actually a collaboration between federal agencies, so it's a collaboration between um, multiple agencies, but you know, Department of Health and Human Services, and uh, Department of Education. So we use that as a conduit, um, and they kind of push it out. And then it's, done, it's pushed out through social media. If you look at their Facebook or Twitter, they, it's on there. Um, NIH has also been a big partner in pushing things out. So we do push it out. I mean, to be, to be quite honest, it's just a challenge because um, not everybody, it's just, it's, it's hard with any kind of product getting the information out, out there in such a wide audience. Um, and, you know, we just don't have the trillion dollars to put, do a huge, you know, campaign to put it on TV and, you know. Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, we do, but the short answer is we do work with our partners, our organizations to get the information out. Right. And you're relying on organizations such as ASHA to help we do like it's going through like partners like ASHA. It's going through um, you know through the Department of Ed, um, through different organizations or our partners that are working on StopBullying.gov. And they actually do have an external. Um, they do have like a steering board, an educational board of external parties that we also work through. It just it's it's a you know we're talking about millions of people. It's a lot of work, and we have a lot of work to do. And so we encourage. Um, ASHA and our partners and everyone on the phone to continue to share the resources that are available to them because it's free. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, next question. When should I notify parents that their child is being bullied? or uh, And when should I notify other administrators? So I think that's a tricky one. I think it all it depends on the severity on um, I think it also it depends on the severity obviously if someone's if somebody's being you know physically harmed I think obviously that's some that's one that you escalate right away I think it so I think it depends on the levels ideally you you approach a child um, and get information first and proceed from there. But I think any time that a child um, a child is being is being bullied that it should definitely be elevated immediately. Um, there's all you know there's greater there's greater harm in waiting versus it's better to be safe than sorry. So we always I would say always um, you know depending on on the severity is how quickly and who you escalate it to, but definitely um, escalating it to administrators and parents is always 
you know, and uh, communicating with the child first um, is very important. Thank you. Next question. Has there been any research to link cultural incompetency with suicide rates? Well, so there has been research, not that I'm aware of, but there has been research to show um, and we go through uh, the, uh, the Agency of Healthcare Quality and Research. Um, obviously, there are disparities that exist. Um, racial and ethnic minorities um, tend to get poor, have poor outcomes and poor um, continuity of care. Um, they also are less likely to have, less likely to um, adhere to medication, um, and so. Part of that is we do know um, that when you have culturally appropriate care that those things shift in the opposite direction. So when you do have cultural competent care, you do see that patients are more likely to adhere to their treatments and medications. They're more likely to adhere, have higher uh, levels of satisfaction with care and more likely to, um, to return uh, to their provider and have open and better conversations. So one thing that we, you know, and I think for healthcare professionals, we we have, and I think we do understand, is that communication is key. When the way that you talk to someone can make or break um, trust. So being sensitive to someone's um, culture, and we define culture as very broad to include uh, religion, uh, sexual preferentation, preference and orientation to include geographical location, uh, social economic status, and so on and so on. It's a very dynamic thing. But being sensitive to that um, can help flourish better relationships and open up more conversations. If you want to know more, we do have tip, uh, that tip that I mentioned on cultural competency, but we also, the Department of Health and Human Services also funds a site called Think Cultural Health. Um, which is a site specifically for cultural, how to have culturally and linguistically appropriate care in health and healthcare services. That's another site I would recommend on that. Great, thank you. The next person has asked, how should we address the overuse of the term bullying? I have seen situations where it has been overused and students are being labeled. So I think we, so on stopbullying.gov we have a clear definition. Um, I think a clear definition, and I don't know if you can pull that slide up. Which, um, which slide number is it? Um, let me see. Let me go through my. Is it, is it this one? Recognizing bullying? Yes. So that's how we define, um, so stopbullying.gov has a clear definition of what we define as bullying. I think that because we have seen in, in the media, and of course there's obvious concerns that anything that's not, if we don't identify and intervene in bullying, there can be um, detrimental effects and, and serious consequences. So I think there's a balance between um, um, between those two things that we need to we need to keep in mind. But I would definitely stop bullying has clearly defined what bullying is, and that's the definition that we we go by. Okay, great. All right, I have one last question because we're coming to the end of the hour. It's a two-parter. Is either app available in any other languages, and has SAMHSA created any other mobile apps? So, great question. So, the app, so um, Suicide Safe has the conversations, so it has elements that are created in Spanish because as healthcare providers, we all know that we are, there's just limitations to who we have available to, um, to in a in a healthcare setting to speak another language, so we do know, and you know, I know firsthand that you know there's physicians and providers that are speaking Spanish that may not um, be trained 
specifically or not have the education base to speak Spanish. But we're speaking Spanish because we have limited resources. So Suicide Safe, um, the conversation starters are available in Spanish um, because those, those questions are so important in drawing out um, suicidal ideation. So that one is, the no bullying content has not been tra translated into any other language. However, the app is being, the features and content is being updated periodically, and so we may start translating that at a, at, at a later time. So you said that was the first question. You have, the second question was what? Do you have any other mobile apps? The other mobile oh, apps. So we do. So we have the disaster app. So, um, and I don't know if anyone from ASHA does do like a deployment for um, for a disaster. So dis the disaster uh, the disaster app is designed. It kind of stemmed from Hurricane Katrina, and I definitely think it's something great for educators because. Um, after Hurricane Katrina, a lot of a lot of individuals were dealing with um, the long-term emotional uh, effects from from the hurricane, and so it allows you to download information on, on individuals that have gone through a traumatic event, um, that have gone through a crisis, and it allows you to have that type of information. An event of tr of a disaster. Now we designed disaster not only hurricane, but we also for mass. Uh, incidences of violence is so, for instance, um, um, shootings, active shooters, and stuff like that. We have a bunch of different um, earthquakes, so we have a bunch of things in what we define as a disaster. So that we have that one, and then the Talk They Hear You, which is the underage drinking app. So the Talk They Hear You is um, is also on our SAMHSA store site. So just to recap, suicide safe, no bullying. Talk to Hear You, and the Disaster App. Okay, great. All right, that is all the time we have. I do want to just send one more reminder to everyone that we will be sending a follow-up email today um, to provide links to the recording and the slides. Um, we'll also provide the evaluation survey so that you can submit for continuing education. And um, I also just wanted to thank you once again, Elizabeth Perez, for presenting this great uh, session on all the resources at SAMHSA for bullying and suicide prevention and also thank all of you for joining us today. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.